Hello, I hope learning about gustation didn't leave a bad taste in your mouth, because we're about to move on to our next chemical scent, olfaction, our sense of smell. The question that I want to start off with is, why do we smell? But wait, one time I asked that question at the start of the olfaction section, and somebody in the back shouted out, because we don't shower. So let me rephrase that as, what is the benefit of having a sense of smell? Early in evolutionary history, having a sense of smell would be evolutionarily beneficial because it enables us to avoid harmful chemicals and ingest good ones and find mates. Olfaction, like gustation, is a chemical sense that is evolutionarily very old. So we can get some clues about how smell has evolved by looking at some of our other evolutionary relatives. For example, a polar bear can smell a seal that's a kilometer away and buried under three feet of snow. A basset hound can follow the scent trail that a human made walking on concrete that's days old. And sharks can smell incredibly low concentrations of blood in water. Nearly two thirds of a shark's brain is devoted to olfactory cortex, that is, is for processing smell. Now you might think that humans are very different from these creatures in terms of our olfactory abilities, and in some ways they are. Public opinion seems to be that for humans, the sense of smell is relatively dispensable. I found one survey that polled 5,000 people in the US and asked them which sense they would most readily give up and smell won by a long shot. The low level of appreciation for smell is documented elsewhere too. The American Medical Association makes determinations about the value of a particular sense based on how much of a loss it would be to a person. That is, if you lose your sense of hearing in an accident, how much comp compensation should you receive? How much is that expected to negatively impact your quality of life? and so forth. For hearing, it's about 35% impairment. Vision is an 85% impairment. Smell, 3%. That's about the same as losing your big toe. One of the claims that I'm going to be making is that our sense of smell is much better and much more important than many people realize. I want to start by pointing out a couple of quirks of the olfactory system. The first is that the olfactory system is somewhat unusual in that the organ that houses our smell receptors or sniffer, uh, has another job, right? We, we breathe with it. So it's not like we pump blood with our eyeballs or we digest food with our ears, right? But we breathe with our nose in addition to smelling with it. That also means that we have some control over how much we experience a smell. I can't like squeeze my eyeballs to try and get more visual input in, and I can't suck in more information into my ears to get more sound in, but I can take a deep breath to try to smell something better. A second quirk of the olfactory system is that smell is the only sense that requires conscious perception. You can't process smells while you're asleep. If I shine a bright light on you, play a loud noise, poke you, those things can all wake you up, but smells don't. Now you may say, oh, but what about when I wake up in the morning to the smell of coffee and bacon frying? And I'd say, well, you wake up and then you smell those things, but it isn't those smells that wake you up. Uh, a few years ago, a company came out with an olfactory alarm clock. The idea being that uh, when you want to wake up, it starts pumping out these scents and then you get to wake up to, you know, coffee and orange juice smell. And when I found this, it's really funny. If you click on the reviews, all of the reviews say, yeah, it's a cool idea, but I don't know. It didn't work. It didn't wake me up. And I was like, yeah, because olfaction requires conscious perception. What's that, Violet? Hey, what about smelling salts? Those will wake you right up. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Yeah, so smelling salts are not olfactory. Uh, you read that there are somatosensory receptors in your nose that code for somatosensory input, as well as the receptors in your nose that code for, code for olfactory input. So the burn of chili peppers, the coolness of mint, and the burn of ammonia and smelling salts are all somatosensory experiences rather than olfactory ones. So just as flavor depends on taste and smell, sniffing things activates both olfactory receptors and somatosensory receptors. Um, let's talk next about how hard it is to talk about smell. Tell me, for example, how a rose smells different from a banana. Like they're both kind of sweet and subtle and like, but one is like rosier and one is like banana, right? It's, it's much harder to describe that difference than describing how a flute sounds different from a bass guitar. Smells also have stronger emotional associations than other senses. We'll talk more about this in a bit. Let's start off by smelling the roses and talking about what the stimulus is. As you read, the stimulus for olfaction are called odorants, and these are volatile chemicals of a particular size and shape. 
So here are just two odorants that we're sensitive to, and the thresholds at which we can detect them. You'll notice that those thresholds differ markedly from one another, and this is true across the olfactory system. There are some odorants that we that need to be at relatively high levels before we can detect them, and others that we can detect at just several parts per trillion. There are also chemicals that are not odorants because we can't smell them. For example, humans can't smell carbon monoxide, which is unfortunate because when we're exposed to it in high enough quantities, it can be deadly. We also can't smell natural gas. Natural gas is totally odorless. No, come on, I can smell natural gas. Ah, aha. That stinky rotten egg smell that you associate with natural gas is actually an additive that gas companies deliberately include so that we can detect the presence of gas leaks. Cool, huh? So like gustation, olfaction is a chemical sense. So we're picking up on the presence of particular types of chemicals in the environment. So how do we turn those odorants into neural code? Let's sniff out the truth. Odorants can get to the olfactory receptors in one of two ways, either orthonasally through sniffing or retronasally when we chew food or have drink in our mouth and those chemicals go up through the back of the throat and into the nasal cavity that way. We talked about retronasal olfaction in our discussion of flavor, but once the odorants are in the nasal cavity, the coating unfolds in the same way regardless of the path it took to get there. So here's what happens. First, odorants enter the nasal cavity. Let's zoom in now on the olfactory epithelium, that region right at the top of the olfactory cavity where the olfactory receptors are. The next step is that the odorants dissolve in the mucus. Just as you don't taste tastants, you taste tastants dissolved in saliva, you don't smell odorants. You smell odorants dissolved in your own mucus. Cool, right? So when you have a cold and your nose is full of mucus, this process breaks down. The nasal cavity becomes so full of mucus that the odorants can't reach the olfactory receptors. So now let's zoom in even more and see what's going on with those olfactory receptor neurons. Okay, the next step is that the odorants make contact with the cilia of the olfactory receptor neurons. As with the gustatory system, these are receptors that respond to specific kinds of odorants. We have something like 20 million different individual olfactory receptor we have something like 20 million individual olfactory receptor neurons in our nose, which is a ton, but bloodhounds have about 10 times as many as we do, which is one of the reasons that they have that they have a more sensitive sense of smell than ours. Okay, so let's pause for a minute and talk about these remarkable receptors and the incredible variability they're in. Humans have over a thousand different types of olfactory receptor neurons, uh, meaning we have a thousand genes that code for olfactory receptor neurons. However, many of these are non-functional. We refer to these as, as pseudogenes. These are genes that are present, but they carry mutations that make it impossible to translate their sequence into a protein and therefore be a functional receptor. So we have a bunch of genes that are duds. Now, this is not unique to humans. Dogs also have pseudogenes. In dogs, it's about 19% of the genes that are these non-functional pseudogenes. In humans, it's more like 65%. So one of the reasons that humans are have a less sensitive sense of smell than dogs is that we have fewer functioning receptors. Another thing that's remarkable about this is that humans vary tremendously from one another in the number of pseudogenes that we have. So in general, typical human has about 350 functional olfactory receptor neurons, but some people have as few as 330 and other people have up to 400. So this is one of the things that accounts for the incredible individual variability in how good our senses of smell are. But it means that there's more sensory variability in the normal range of olfaction than in any other sense. In vision, if you're missing one kind of receptor, you're colorblind. In olfaction, you can be missing 60 receptor types and still be in the typical range. So what are the consequences of having pseudogenes? Well, having a pseudogene for a particular olfactory receptor neuron leads to what's called a specific anosmia. This is the inability or altered ability to detect a particular odorant. Specific anosmias are relatively common given the large individual variability in which pseudogenes people have. For example, about one in 1,000 people are lucky enough to have a specific anosmia for the rancid smell of skunk. So when the rest of us are saying, oh, what is it? It smells so bad. Those people are saying, what's happening? I don't smell anything. Note that sometimes if you get close enough to a skunk, in addition to having an olfactory experience, you also have a somatosensory experience. Your nose burns, your eyes burn and tear up. 
And even people who have a specific anosmia, so can't experience the olfactory component of a skunk, would still have that somatosensory reaction if the smell is strong enough. Specific anosmias can also account for the great cilantro debate, why some people love cilantro and some people hate it. So cilantro is typically coded for by receptors that are sensitive to both the floral, fruity, yummy component of cilantro and the like clean, green, soapy component of it. If both of those are activated, you get the very pleasant, fresh, green, floral scent of cilantro. If you have a pseudogene for the floral component, I'm looking at you, mom. That means that you're only experiencing that fresh, green, yeah, soapy component. Another common specific anosmia is one that I happen to have, and I'm told that I'm fortunate to have it. I'm told that after eating asparagus, urine can smell in a particularly foul and distinctive way. About 40% of people know that because 60% of us have pseudogenes that code for that odorant, so we don't detect it. We each walk in our own perceptual world, and this is particularly true in the olfactory system because there is such a tremendous range in what constitutes normal senses of smell. All right, so back to our process of transduction. When the odorants bind to the olfactory receptor neurons, they cause the olfactory receptor neurons to become depolarized and send action potentials up to the brain via the olfactory nerve. Uh, as with some of our gustatory sensation, this process happens via G-protein coupled receptors, meaning that odorants bind to receptors in the olfactory receptor neurons, which lead to an electrochemical cascade that ultimately opens ion channels, positively charged ions enter, and the cell depolarizes. Okay, so let's now talk about how we go from action potentials in particular olfactory receptor neurons to uh, a recognition of an odor. As in the gustatory system, the olfactory system uses population coding in order to evaluate which odors are present. And if you think about it, that must be the case because we can detect many more odorants than we have types of olfactory receptor neurons. Right? We've got like 350-ish functional receptor types, but we can distinguish between thousands, maybe millions of different odors. As a simple example, let's look at three different types of olfactory receptor neurons, shown here in green and blue and red. The lines represent firing rates, so the number of action potentials in a given period of time. When a citrus scent is present, neuron 1, right here, has a moderate firing rate, neuron 2 responds a little bit, and neuron three doesn't respond at all. One thing to notice is that neuron two responds in exactly the same way to peppermint and to almond. So if we were to put an electrode into that cell and recorded its response, we would get the exact same signal for almond and for peppermint. Uh, so we can't possibly tell from an individual cell's response which odor is present. But but by looking at all of the different types of olfactory receptor neurons together, we can determine the quality of what we're smelling. So how do we go from action potentials to odors? That is, how do we interpret that code from the olfactory receptor neurons? Just to sum up to here, odorants enter the nose, they dissolve in the mucus, they bind to and then lead to depolarization of the olfactory receptor neurons. Those signals are summated or combined in the olfactory bulb and then carried up to the brain. The olfactory bulbs where the uh, axons of the, the olfactory bul bulbs where the axons of the olfactory receptor neurons first make contact uh, are relatively visible on the surface of the brain. If we were to pick up a brain and flip it over and look at the underside of it, the olfactory bulbs are visible and quite prominent, shown here in red. So the distance between where the information has to go from your nasal cavity to the brain is quite small. Let's let a nice lady in a Star Trek outfit run us through that whole process with a nice little animation. Once the molecules enter the nose, they travel into a small patch of tissue called the olfactory membrane. The olfactory membrane is very small and located at the top of the nasal cavity. The membrane is made up of yellow-gray tissue and covered with a thick mucus. Within the membrane are many receptor cells, which are considered to be extensions of the brain itself. It has been theorized that each receptor cell is sensitive to the dimensions of a particular molecule. Once the correct molecule has been attached to the matching receptor cell, a nerve impulse is created. The nerve impulse will continue to the brain through a thin bone in the forehead 
called the cribriform plate. Beyond this plate lies the olfactory bulbs, where the nerve impulse will make its first junction with the brain. In the olfactory bulb are many structures called glomeruli. The primary function of these structures is to distribute the converging nerve impulses to the brain in an orderly fashion. In the brain, the impulses are scattered to different areas, where they are decoded and odors perceived. Scientists have determined that the human brain can identify between thousands of different odors. Thus, it is safe to say that the sense of smell is one of the most remarkable assets of the human body. Okay, now let's get that information from the nose up to the brain. The olfactory system is primarily ipsilateral, meaning that information from your left nostril is processed primarily in left cortex. When I found out about this, this fact really blew my mind. I had, I guess, unconsciously thought that we have two nostrils, but it just goes to like one big hole in our head where all of that information is, you know, breathed and processed. But it turns out that all of this processing happens in parallel on the left and the right side. Now our nostrils are pretty close together, but there's some distance between them, meaning that our two olfactory bulbs get slightly different information, right? If an odor comes from over there, chances are that I'll experience that odor more strongly in this nostril than in this one. So that process of comparing the inputs from, from two different sources is what allows us to localize things in space in some other senses. And it's one of the things that allows dogs to localize objects uh, uh, out, out in the real world. So bloodhounds, for instance, one of the reasons that they can track things using only their nose is that because their nostrils are far apart, they're comparing the inputs and, and going in the direction where the, the stimulus is coming more strongly from. So it's shown on the screen here uh, is the trail of a pheasant and the path that a bloodhound might follow as it's tracking it. So it's sniffing. Ooh, it's strong over here. I'm gonna keep going over this way and so forth. Okay, so there's a group of researchers who wanted to test whether humans' olfactory abilities have similar capabilities in the right circumstances. So they wanted to train people to localize using just their nose. Rather than having them track a pheasant, they had them track chocolate essential oil, as chocolate is something that the human species is known to be fond of, just as dogs are fond of pheasants. Uh, so they, they soaked a rope in chocolate essential oil, put it in a field, and asked humans to try to follow their nose to, to, to follow the path of this rope. Uh, in order to remove the influence of any other sensory systems, they put, on, they put goggles on them, and they put on gloves so that they couldn't feel where the rope was. And you know what? people were able to complete the task. They tracked the chocolate. The method sections don't say this, but I hope that they got chocolate at the end as a reward, right? They worked so hard for it. Okay, but how do we know this is about localization, right? We don't know, we don't so far know that this is about comparing the inputs from both nostrils or just about olfactory ability more generally. So to test this, the researchers also systematically altered the olfactory information that people got. So they put these devices on them that either retained the spatial information, that is, as shown on the left here, there are two holes spaced apart, one leading to each nostril, or they had a device that just had one hole on the outside, as shown here, and then that information made it through both, made it into both of the nostrils, so that people got identical information to both nostrils. They then had them complete the chocolate tracking task again, and they found that participants were slower and less accurate at the tracking task when they couldn't use the physical spacing of their nostrils as a tracking cue. How cool is the olfactory system? The researchers said, these findings suggest that the poor reputation of human olfaction may reflect in part behavioral demands rather than ultimate abilities. So the researchers concluded that our sense of smell is really better than we give it credit for. Next time, we'll talk about why it may be more important than we give it credit for in terms of our emotional experiences as well. That's it for today. Smell you later. Between the olfactory cavity and the olfactory bulb is the cribriform plate. This is a piece of bone full of holes. Think of it as like bony Swiss cheese. A hard hit to the head can cause the olfactory nerves to be severed completely. So it just shears through the axons of those olfactory receptor neurons. Unlike specific anosmias, which can affect some odorants but not others, physical or complete anosmia completely eliminates the sense of smell altogether. 
Um, however, an interesting point is that the somatosensory signals that we have that that we get from the nose, so the sensation of burny or skunk or mintiness, those signals are carried via the trigeminal nerve, as you read about, and that does not travel through the cribriform plate, so are not affected in the same way by these hard hits to the head. Therefore, people who have physical anosmia from physical damage can still likely experience somatosensory sensations they get from their nose. Physical anosmia can also be induced chemically. In 2006, people began using a nasal spray made by Zycam that was intended to shorten the length of the common cold. Uh, the FDA doesn't regulate homeopathic treatments like this, and so the substance was not tested or approved by the FDA. Unfortunately, the active ingredient in Zycam, zinc, turns out to be completely toxic to olfactory receptor neurons in high doses. So this product caused partial or complete anosmia for hundreds of people and millions of dollars in lawsuits for Zycam. And because this physical anosmia was chemically induced, because it caused cell death, it affected both the olfactory and somatosensory receptors. So people who have this kind of physical anosmia both can't smell and also can't experience somatosensory experiences via their nose. Be careful what you put in your noses, gang. You may have heard recently that some patients with COVID-19 have also reported anosmia, and it may even be an early symptom uh, that, that the onset of which happens before other symptoms. Um, at the time that I recorded this, the mechanism for uh, COVID-19 induced anosmia isn't clear. It's possible that the virus leads to inflammation in the nasal cavity and therefore interferes with odorants reaching the olfactory receptor neurons. It may damage the olfactory receptor neurons in some temporary way because patients get olfactory function back after they've recovered, um, or there may be some other mechanism. We'll see. Okay, so in this problem set question, why might a perfume f smell funny after you've been smelling other things? It's like the cake and lemonade example we did in Gustation, but for your nose. So let's take a fictional subset of 14 different olfactory receptor neurons shown here. Normally, when you smell the first odorant, A, at the top there, it activates neurons 4, 5, 7, and so forth. And we interpret activity from all of those neurons simultaneously as smelling sweet, orangey, floral. B... Odorant B activates a different set of olfactory receptor neurons. So if we were to adapt on scent A, neurons 4, 5, 7, and 10 will uh, adapt and reduce their firing rate. Those neurons, we will see a, a fatigued response from them. Then when we switch back to odorant B, rather than getting robust firing rates from 1, 4, 5, 7, and so forth, you're just getting high firing rates from the olfactory receptor neurons that are not in common with A meaning B ends up smelling different than it typically does. Okay, so for number three, we would expect uh, different patterns of activation in anterior piriform cortex, because that is the one that is coding for the chemical structure of the odorants. Uh, but you would expect equivalent patterns of activation in posterior piriform, which is coding for kind of the more perceptual experience of the odor, and orbitofrontal, which is associated with the emotional or affective experience.